Luke chapter 16, I think, is probably a challenging, I, I would suppose, to say, uh, chapter to interpret. But actually, it's not that difficult. It's very interesting. You know, the past two or three weeks, uh, I've not had a PowerPoint up here simply because you can't break these chapters up into sections. Because like last week when we were looking at chapter 15 of Luke, Luke gives the account of Christ being criticized for associating with tax gatherers and with sinners and receiving them. And I'm sure glad he does because he received me a few decades ago. And if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, he's received you too. Be grateful that he associates with and receives sinners. But the Pharisees and the scribes were criticizing him for doing that. And so Jesus told three parables. The parable of the lost sheep. On the heels of that was the parable of the lost coin. And then on the heels of that, the parable of the lost son. So you just can't break those up because the main point is, is that God loves these sinners. God loves these tax gatherers that are coming to me and that you are being critical of. It. And in reality, you need to come to me too because you are just as unrighteous as they are, speaking to the Pharisees and the scribes. They were religious, but the problem is they weren't righteous. Well, it's this same group that is in earshot of the instruction that Jesus is about to give his disciples in chapter 16. And it's a topic that often is shunned from the pulpits. And it has to do with money, money, money. And the attitude toward it. And the wisdom of the world from which you and I can actually learn some spiritual implications. And so we're going to look at Luke chapter 16. And the reason I didn't put it all up there is because it's 31 verses. And it would take quite some time to click through that. So follow along with me. Turn in your Bible or turn on your Bible to Luke chapter 16. 16. And I want to give us a little bit of context because this is the same group that is in earshot that had just criticized Christ for associating with and receiving sinners, tax gatherers, and unrighteous people. Now Jesus in verse 1 of chapter 16 says, Now he was also saying to his disciples, This instruction is for his disciples. But he also has a criticism for those who are eavesdropping. And I'm going to read verse 14 to you. Now the Pharisees who were lovers of money were listening to all these things. So what Gary just read, verses 1 through 13, Jesus had an audience. It wasn't just his disciples, but it was those who loved money. They were lovers of money and were listening to all these things and were scoffing at him. So this is the social context in which chapter 16 falls. It is the same group of people that has criticized him and that he's speaking to in chapter 15. And Jesus tells this story about a rich man who had a manager and this manager was reported to him as squandering his possessions. Bad manager. And so the owner called him to himself and said, What's this I hear about you? Give an account of your management, for you can no longer be my manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do? Since my master is taking the management away from me, I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. 
I know what I'll do. So that when I am removed from the management, people will welcome me into their homes. And he summoned each one of his master's debtors. And he began saying to the first, how much do you owe my master? Well, some manager, he didn't even know how much he owed his master. No wonder he's being fired. He said, a hundred measures of oil. I wonder if it wasn't 200. And he said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to the other, to another, he said, how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said, take your bill and write 80. And his master praised the unrighteous manager. Now notice this. The master praised the unrighteous manager. Because he had acted shrewdly. Not honestly, but he had acted shrewdly. Listen to what it goes on to say. For the sons, listen to what Jesus says here. The sons of this age, that is unbelievers, people who do not follow God and do not have reverence for God, But listen to what he says about them. The sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light. Now keep in mind, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. His days are numbered. And his disciples still have much instruction to be received. And Christ is going to teach them a very important principle about the utilization of money and wealth For the furtherance of the kingdom of God. A means through which you can use your wealth, the sustenance, and the stewardship that God has given you to help others come into the kingdom. I'm not bending this, listen. Jesus says, I say to you, and he's saying to his disciples here. On the heels of this story about this very shrewd manager who even though he was not honest with his owner, the owner praised him because he was shrewd. His intention was was self-serving. And to get the praise of men, not the praise of the owner, nor the praise of God, but to ensure that he had a dwelling to go to and friends to be made by virtue of the fact of giving them a hefty discount. And so the owner praises him for that. He's acting more shrewdly than even we ourselves often act when it comes to wealth and the means by which God has given us. We're not to utilize the gifts and the the wealth the sustenance that God has given us to be self-serving. He was self-serving, but Jesus is going to be talking about a principle that is just the opposite, that we are not to be hoarders, that we are to be shrewd, but not in the ways of the world. We're not to be dishonest in the ways of the world, but to be shrewd in the sense that we utilize the means that God has given us to help others come into the kingdom of God. Listen to what it says here. Jesus said in verse 9, I say to you, make friends for yourselves. He's speaking to the disciples. Make friends for yourselves by means of the wealth of unrighteousness, by earthly wealth. Use that so that when it fails, because economies will fail, money will fail, bank accounts will fail, credit cards will fail. And when you die, I have a little secret for you, you're going to leave it all. It's going to fail. But where are we to lay up treasures? Jesus says to lay up treasures in heaven where moth and rust and corruption does not not even touch it. Make for yourselves by means of the wealth of unrighteousness. In other words, use the sustenance that you have so that when it fails, they will receive you into the eternal dwellings. Who are they? The they are those who benefit 
spiritually because they are those who will be in eternal dwellings. Who's going to be in eternal dwellings? The righteous, those who have trusted and embraced the Messiah. Listen as we go further. He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. God wants us to be faithful with the means that he has given us to be a means in our hands and his hands to further the kingdom of God and to help others come into the kingdom through faith. In other words, fund ministries. Use it to reach others, to minister to others who need to come into the kingdom of God. Be shrewd. Be wise like the world, though the world uses their means for self-serving reason. We are to use it sacrificially to benefit others for eternal reasons and benefits. Make friends for yourselves by means of the wealth of unrighteousness so that when it fails, they will receive you into the eternal dwellings. Folks, let me tell you something. This tells me that people will know in the economy of God, in the future, and in the kingdom of God, the ministry that you and I have helped fund and provide and support and encourage and people are, have benefited from it, they are going to know and understand that you were faithful, that you were shrewd in utilizing the means that God has given you to further the kingdom of God. To use unrighteous mammon, as it were, unrighteous wealth in a righteous way. God has given us our homes, our cars. He's given us our bank accounts. And we are to utilize that as a means in God's hands to further the kingdom of God. Utilize for yourselves the wealth of unrighteousness so that when it fails, which it will, they will receive you into the eternal dwelling. He who is faithful is faithful in, uh, faithful in little is faithful in much. And he who is unrighteous is in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. He's talking about character here. He's not talking about just actions. But he's talking about character. Do the right thing in the right way with the right motives. You know, money is one of those things. It's a strange thing. The love of money, it says, is the root of all evil. It doesn't say money is the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. And I like uh, watching uh, Agatha Christie mysteries. And often when there's a murder or a suicide or something like that, it often comes up in those series that says, follow the money. The mammon, the wealth of unrighteousness. And it motivates people to do very strange and wicked things. Therefore, he says in verse 11, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust the true riches to you? What are the true riches? Those are eternal riches. There's eternal blessing and benefit when you and I act righteously in regards to the wealth and the sustenance that God has given you and me. Because it is a means to further the kingdom of God. To provide platforms whereby others and yourself can serve by means of bringing others into the kingdom of God through faith in Jesus Christ. No servant, he says, can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in wealth. Keep in mind, who is he talking to? Verse 14 tells us, the Pharisees who were lovers of money. They were motivated not out of faith and righteousness and obedience, but they were motivated so that they themselves might be comforted and prosper and benefit and serve. Their, what it ends up is, is they are serving not God, 
but their own desire for wealth and money itself. They were lovers of money. And they were listening at all of these things that he was saying and scoffing at him. Because they knew in their hearts that they were not wise with their money in the sense of building up the kingdom of God. Who did they want to build up? Themselves. But how often do we hear preaching coming even out of the pulpits and on radio and on television of gimme, gimme, gimme. But the problem is it goes into the coffer of the one who's saying gimme, gimme, gimme. And people are not benefiting. Ministries are not funded. The word of God is not going forth. Messiah is not being exalted. Who's being served and who's being exalted? Be me, me. The one who says, gimme, gimme, gimme. And he said to them, you are those, he's saying now to the Pharisees, not to the disciples. He said to them, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men. But God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. Serving oneself and looking from an outward perspective as being righteous, God knows our hearts and he knows our motives and he knows how we use our means. And what might look good on the outside from a human perspective is despised by Almighty God. The Pharisees, the scribes and the Sadducees, Jesus was constantly criticizing them. They wanted to pray in public places. Why? So that they might be admired. They wanted to make their phylacteries large. That's the little phylactery, the little box that goes on the forehead. The bigger the phylactery, the more scripture can fit in there. The more scripture that you got bound around your head, the more righteous you must be. Funny to have a phylactery about that big. I think I'm going to wear one next time. <laughs> Have one about that big, and y'all are going to just be in awe at just how holy and righteous and knowledgeable and understanding that I am. <laughs> he tells the Pharisees, You are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your heart, for that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. And then he really gets to the point. Now, you might think that the next verses seem to be totally out of place, but they're not because they're part of this pericope, this, this larger idea here. Jesus is actually going to the heart and to the soul and to the minds of the Pharisees who have not just criticized him for receiving tax gatherers and sinners but also telling his disciples, don't be like these guys. Don't be lovers of money, but be users of money so that you might help bring others into the kingdom of God so that when you enter the kingdom of God and all of that wealth or that means has gone by the wayside because you're going to leave it all, you're going to meet the people who have been blessed and benefited by your sacrificial giving. That's what he's talking about here, is the wise use of money. Not as the world does, because the world wants, give me, give me, give me, comfort me, comfort me, comfort me. But no, give so that others may know Messiah, trust Messiah, embrace Messiah, serve Messiah. Good illustration is supporting missionaries. Using our means and our wealth to help others further the gospel so that the kingdom of God may advance through the faith, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Fund, helping fund local churches, funding other parachurch ministries that are kingdom minded and serving the kingdom of God so that others may come into the kingdom of God. That from God's perspective, is a shrewd manager of the means that he has given you and me. That's the wise steward. But Jesus, because they're scoffing here, 
And because they're lovers of money and scoffing at what he's teaching his disciples, he turns to them and says to them in verses 16, 17, and 18, which seem like they're out of place, but they're not because they're part of this greater thought. And then on the heels of that, he tells us a story about a rich man in Lazarus. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the gospel of the kingdom of God, excuse me, has been preached. And everyone is forcing his way into it. You can't force, and then here's the point, you cannot force your way into the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is offered as a gift by grace through faith in the Messiah. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes were trying to force their way and to force others to force their way into the kingdom of God by virtue of their theology, their doctrine, their good works, their self-righteousness, and force their way into the kingdom of God. But you can't do that. The kingdom of God is a gift by grace through faith in Christ. Jesus is saying, the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the gospel of the kingdom has been preached. Everyone is forcing his way into it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of the letter of the law to fail. You see, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes had even invented the oral law, which they followed. And elevate it equal, if not higher, than God's law. And they were not following the, the teaching and the provision of God's law, whereby they could come in to the kingdom of God. Now, Abraham's a good example, and Paul uses him in the book of Romans, where Abraham believed God. And God credited it to him as righteousness. You see, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, eternal life in the kingdom of God and entrance into the kingdom of God has always been by grace through faith. It has never been by law. It has never been by works. The law was given to show man that he is unrighteous, that God is holy, and that you need a mediator between him and or be it between man and God. And the ultimate mediator is who? Messiah. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. But those who were forcing their way or attempting to force their way into it was doing it by works, their own effort, their own righteousness, which Scripture tells us is as filthy rags. Folks, we have absolutely nothing to bring to the table when it comes to salvation. Nothing. Jesus says that you're trying to make your own way when God has already dictated the way and you're trying to force your way into it, but he says, let me tell you something. It'll be easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of the law, the letter of the law, to fail. In other words, no matter how hard you try and how hard you work and how determined you are, you are not going to change the word of God. You're not going to change the mind of God. You are not going to change the Bible. You come to God on his terms, not your own. And that's what the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, the religious, were trying to do. How many people today are still trying to come to God on their own? Thinking they are good enough, thinking they're righteous enough, thinking that their belief system is just as good as the other belief system whether it's Buddha or whether it's Islam or Confucianism. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. How clear can it be? And how simple is it? 
God has made it clear and he has made it simple and he says it's going to be easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for even one little stroke of the law to pass away. We're not going to change God's word. I don't care if I get up here and preach from second Pharaohs. It's not going to change God's word. And that's why we must preach and teach within context. And then Jesus gives them an example. And this stands out and it's like, where on earth did this come from? Because it seems so out of joint, out of place, out of context. But actually it is fit perfectly in context. Jesus said in verse 18, Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and he who marries one who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. Where on earth did that come from? He's talking about money. He's talking about selfish motives. He's talking about wise stewardship in the sight of God, not wise stewardship in the sight of man, but wise stewardship in the sight of God. How in the world did divorce get in here? How in the world did marriage get in here? The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes knew exactly what Jesus was talking about because they had a very liberal view of divorce. God hates divorce, but he also makes certain provision for divorce. In case of adultery, in case of an unbelieving spouse, leaving that believing spouse. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes had a very broad view of the permission of divorce that anyone could divorce their wife and marry another, regardless of the circumstance. But God holds a much narrower circumstance, giving provision, but only in a narrow sense. But they had a much broader interpretation and application to it And often would let the men remarry, but would prohibit the women from remarrying even. And that's why Jesus mentions marriage and divorce here, is because it goes to the core of their teaching and pointing out, bringing to their mind, that just because you teach it doesn't make it true from God's perspective and in accordance to his law. You can't twist and turn and ignore and cherry pick the truth of God's word. You must place it in context. You are then disobedient. I can't get up here and say just anything that I want to accommodate me or to accommodate you. You know, Paul warned against it. And he said there's coming a time when people will have itchy ears. They want to be tickled. And they're going to have preachers and teachers and Sunday school teachers and all that. They're going to tell them exactly what they want to hear. And it may not fill the coffers. People might stop giving. They might stop coming. They might stop tuning in. They might not have as large of an audience. May not be a, a national audience anymore if we don't tickle their ears and preach to them something that feeds their flesh. But Jesus is cutting through the chase here and confronting the Pharisees and giving them an example that they are heeding to their own interpretation of the Word of God, following their own law rather than obeying God's Word. They are the unrighteous managers of what God had given them and serving themselves and not serving the kingdom. And he tells a story in verse 19. Now there was a rich man and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, jealously or joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, and he was covered with sores. And longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table, besides even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now, from a human perspective and from the perspective of the culture of that day, if you had wealth, God must be shining his face upon you, and you must be living right. But if you are suffering, and you're living at a disadvantage, and you're hurting, 
then you must be sinning somewhere in your life. That is a false assumption based on their philosophy and their theology. If I have money, I must be righteous. I must be doing right. If I'm pleasing man and have the, the accolades from mankind, I must be doing something right. But in fact, the rich man is totally the opposite. Who was he serving? He was like the unrighteous steward, the unrighteous manager. He was serving himself. Ignoring the needs of Lazarus, who he had to pass every day, anytime he went out and came back into his home. And there he was, laid at his gate, covered with sores, the dogs licking his wounds or his sores. And now the poor man died. Well, my goodness, if he died, he's going to split hell wide open because he must have done something bad not living right and not pleasing God. And that's not what Jesus says. The poor man died and was carried by, away by the angels to Abraham's bosom and the rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades he lifted up his eyes being in torment and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue. For I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received good things. And likewise, Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here and you are in agony. Where was the rich man's dependence? Where was his trust? And where was his love? It was in wealth, in material things. But where was Lazarus? Lazarus is obviously one who followed the words of Moses and had faith in God, trusted God, even though he was living in terrible, deplorable, adverse circumstances and situations as low as you could get, and from a human perspective must have done something wrong. God certainly didn't love him. In fact, God probably hated him because he was in the condition he was. But in fact, he was a man of faith, a man of trust, a man of hope. He had absolutely nothing to offer the rich man, had nothing to offer God. None of us do. But the rich man thinking, hey, I'm okay. I've got all this. I'm comfortable. I'm buying anything, doing anything, eating anything, having any friends that I want, party all the time, whatever I, I want to do. But yet... When it came time for eternity, the rich man was in torment. Lazarus was comforted. Verse 26, Abraham tells him, Besides all this, between you and us and you, there's a great chasm fixed, so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able, and that none may cross over from here or there to us. And he said to them, Well, then I beg you, Father, that you send to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Well, he knew that they wouldn't listen to Moses and the prophets because he didn't. Because if you listen to Moses and the prophets, what would you do? You would repent. And you would trust God and depend upon him. And through faith you would be declared righteous. But he said, no, Father Abraham. But if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, what did Jesus just tell the Pharisees and the scribes? You don't, you don't listen. You have your own law. You're trying to come in on your own terms. What were they not doing? They were not listening to Moses and they were not listening to the prophets because if they had, they would have understood how to be truly righteous and how to enter into the kingdom of God. But no, they wanted their own way. And the rich man got his way. 
But he said to them, or said, said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. What a poignant expose of the heart of man, of unrighteous man, in matters of wealth and in the matters of faith. Because if we are of faith, we recognize that the the blessings, the wealth, the provision, the means that have been given to us, where do they come from? They come from Almighty God. And they are a tool in our hands, a means in our hands, whereby we, whereby God, through us, furthers the kingdom so that others may hear the gospel, come into the kingdom of God, and inhabit the eternal dwellings that are there. You know, Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go and prepare a place for you. And I'm coming again to receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. We have an eternal dwelling. And we're entering that eternal dwelling. And we're even serving right now on the shoulders of others who have given, who have prayed, who have ministered. And who have been a means in God's hands to ultimately bring us to a place of faith as well. Contributing to the ministry then that you and I have now. And so what do we do? We need to open our homes. We need to open our pocketbooks. We need to use the means that God has given us to further the kingdom of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Support your local church, support parachurch ministries, support wisely, wisely ministries that are furthering the kingdom of God through faith in Christ. Make sure they're preaching and teaching the word of God, that they're faithful to scripture. Starts at home, but it can branch out. So we are to be wise stewards. We're to be wise managers of the owner who has given us the means to make friends by way of the means of un mammon or wealth of unrighteousness so that they too may enter in and even welcome us when we get there, when we get there too. God is serving us so that we might serve Don't hold on to things too tightly. Be wise in your stewardship. And I know many, many of you are very giving, very benevolent, because you want to see souls saved. You want to see people saved. You want to see the kingdom of God grow. You want to see God honored. You want to see Christ exalted. You want to see the kingdom of God expand. Let's be righteous in our stewardship. Come to God on his terms, not our own. He will be blessed, he will be honored, and we'll not have the praise of men, but we'll have the praise of God. That's what we ought to want. First and foremost, the praise of God and not the praise of men. Not to be popular, but to be obedient. Be trusting but also to be trustworthy. Knowing too that just as the rich man who squandered his wealth didn't pay attention to his own spiritual needs, certainly didn't pay attention to the spiritual needs of others, Lazarus and others, but squandered just like the, the lost son who squandered all the wealth that his father had given him. See a parallel here? See implications and instruction not only to the disciples, but also to those who are in earshot, criticizing and who are scoffing because they knew exactly what Jesus was saying and they knew that they were guilty. Let's be faithful in everything that God has given us and called us to do to further the kingdom of God. One of these days, you're going to leave it all behind. It's going to fail you. It's not going to keep you alive. It won't even keep you healthy. But use it as a means to benefit those 
eternal things. Those who will inhabit the eternal dwellings. One day you're going to see them face to face. And you're going to see what your giving, what your ministry, what your service, what your prayers, and what your commitment has done for the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for granting to us the means that we have. May we be faithful as stewards to further the kingdom of God through faith in Christ. May we be wise and seek your pleasure and not our own, and certainly not the accolades of men. May you be blessed, O oh God, in all that we do, and how we serve, and what we give, and to whom we give it. May we hold on to things loosely, knowing that it all belongs to you. Father, we look forward to the day that we'll be able to see those who have been blessed and who have benefited by our giving in our service and our stewardship for your glory, honor. His bowed. I'm going to ask you right now. Are you a steward of Christ? Are you a child of God? Are you a servant of God? Have you trusted him as your son? come to that point where you realize and you know now that Jesus died for you that he paid your sin debt in full and that he rose again seated at the right hand of God and coming again just as he has said and as he has promised have you trusted him if your answer is no call out to him right now Lord save me and he will hear he will save and he will use you to further his kingdom. If you're here and you want to join New Hope Christian Fellowship, I want you to slip that hand up, Pastor Don. He'll slip, get a little application card in your hand. Be a part of this fellowship. Father, as we go forth now, May we good, be good stewards this week. May we further the kingdom of God by our service and our giving, by our prayers and our faith. And may you be glorified because you're the one accomplishing it through us. We're not doing it of ourselves or for ourselves, but for your glory and the exaltation of your son. For it is in Christ's holy name that we bless you. In the name of Jesus.